So um, before I get started uh, on the presentation tonight about the Urban Forest Plan, I do want to respectfully acknowledge that the town of Gibson is located on the unceded territory of the Squamish Omich or the Squamish Nation. Um, and a little agenda for tonight. So uh, the first four items on this agenda uh, are part of the presentation. So I'll be going through a little overview of what the project is um, before talking about current progress and what we found so far about uh, Gibson's Urban Forest. Next, number three, I'll be addressing uh, some of the biggest challenges and opportunities uh, facing the town in managing its urban forest uh, before a brief debrief uh, about next steps before we move on to the question and answer portion of the evening. So what is an urban forest? Well, the urban forest, simply put, is every tree within the municipal boundary of Gibsons. And why are we defining the urban forest that way? Well, it's because every tree within that municipal boundary contributes something to the whole. Uh, and of course, the town of Gibsons has, under local government legislation in BC, a mandate to manage trees within that municipal boundary. So the urban forest can be found throughout Gibsons in natural areas, commercial areas, along streams, uh, in residential areas where people live, in urban parks, uh, as well as downtown or on the foreshore. Um, it exists uh, everywhere throughout the town that trees grow. And what is urban forestry? Well, the definition on the slide that I've uh, picked up here is the art, science, and technology of managing trees and forest resources in and around urban community ecosystems for the physiological, sociological, economic, and aesthetic benefits trees provide society. And I know that that definition is a bit of a mouthful, but it starts us thinking about some of those uh, key, uh, key words uh, for the urban forest plan, things like ecosystem um, and some of the benefits that trees can provide in the city, uh, whether they be you know, personal to you, wider for the community, economic in nature, uh, or just having to do with beauty. Um, the urban forest, uh, I, I, I want to share while we're sort of looking at this beautiful image uh, in the background of the slide, uh, the, ur the urban forest is something that helps make Gibson's Gibson's. And to extend on that, um, trees provide many benefits uh, to Gibson. So among those uh, are included, uh, you know, they provide habitat for wildlife in the town. Um, they cool the air uh, through either evapotranspiration or shade, which can help reduce the urban heat island effect. Um, they reduce stormwater runoff by capturing rainwater and, and moving it away from city storm drains. They improve air quality, provide uh, places to recreate and go for walks, spend time with your family. Um, in so doing, they often improve our mental and physical health. Uh, and they can also do things like stabilize steep slopes, among many, many others. So why do we need the plan? Well, life can be hard for trees in urban areas. Um, the urban forest faces many challenges, uh, among them climate change, uh, having enough space for trees to grow, um, the ability for a tree to find enough soil volume. And some of these challenges uh, can mean that urban trees may only live 20 or 30 years on average, where uh, in a more natural environment, they could live over a century. Um, so trees also need management to provide safe, sustainable value for the community. So management may be needed to reduce risk from trees falling and harming people or property, uh, fuel hazards in a world with more wildfire because of climate change, as well as conflicts with other uses of urban space, um, which might be you know, a home, a shop, uh, a private patio, or, or even uh, parking uh, so that people can get from, uh, to and from home and work. So another reason that Gibson's needs the urban forest plan, uh, Gibson's is making advances in what we call natural asset management. And some forested areas in the town are already valued for their role in managing stormwater runoff. Uh, and trees with the services that they can provide, those urban forest benefits can also be incorporated into the town's asset management, although they are not currently. Uh, and so this means uh, without active management, the urban forest, it can have too many trees over on the left uh, where the costs of management uh, are out, uh, I'm sorry, outweigh uh, the, the benefits, i.e. like a smaller tree that's newly planted or young um, will have more cost. Uh, if it ends its life prematurely, then it doesn't get to this middle part of the graph um, where it's providing a lot of that value to the community.
So with that in mind, what is the plan setting out to do? Well, a couple of things. Uh, namely, the genesis of the plan is that we can't manage what we don't have information for. So doing the urban forest plan is part of building our knowledge about Gibson's uh, urban forest and the condition of trees in the town. So from that knowledge of the present, we can build a vision for the future. And through participating in public engagement, you can also directly participate in building that vision. So with a vision and our current condition of the urban forest established, uh, the urban forest plan will inform or include goals and targets that are backed by recommendations. And those recommendations may touch on how trees are planted, protected, cared for, and monitored, as well as how the public can become more involved in urban forest management. That was my brief overview on uh, uh, the scope of the project. And now I'm gonna be sharing some of those uh, uh, results from uh, uh, what we found so far about uh, the urban forest in Gibsons. So these results are coming from um, uh, the first phase of work, uh, which you can see was dedicated to background research and review. We're currently here on uh, the STAR over winter 2024. Uh, with a bit of public engagement to understand what the community visions and values for the urban forest are. And I'll have more to say about that towards the end of the presentation. Um, but at this time, we haven't started drafting the plan in earnest because we need to hear from the community and we also need to do some additional work uh, to put together the pieces of information that we've collected so far. Uh, once we have uh, done that work of drafting the plan uh, through this winter and later into spring, there will be another opportunity for the public uh, to come back and provide feedback on the draft plan before it's finalized. So in this section, I'm going to share uh, some of the results from what we found so far. And uh, for that, it can be helpful if uh, we all understand what I mean by the concept of canopy cover, which is a key way that we measure Gibson's urban forest. So canopy cover is a metric that we use to assess the quantity and extent of the urban forest in Gibsons. And all it is, is really the area of the ground that's occupied by tree crowns when you look at them from above. Um, so it's essentially the area of that approximate rough circle uh, over on the right-hand side of that image on the slide. And how do we uh, uh, compile this information? Well, uh, we do it using a mapping technology uh, that involves LIDAR or light detection and ranging. And that essentially means that a drone or aircraft has been used to send invisible pings of light vertically, which bounce back, uh, uh, showing the distance between the aircraft and the nearest surface, which could be a tree, a house, a street, or, or whatever. And millions of pings can create a 3D image of the town, which is then read by a computer uh, against imagery, um, like you see on Google Earth to determine uh, where trees are. And then the mapping is reviewed by urban foresters. So what is the town's canopy cover? Well, within that town boundary in 2020, Gibson's canopy cover was 38%, or 38% of the land base was covered by tree crowns. So that's 168 hectares within the town's total area of 438 hectares. And um, you can see that canopy cover is prevalent in natural areas within the community, such as around Gibson Creek and Charmin Creek. Uh, it's prevalent in rural areas towards the northwest of the town, and it is more scattered uh, in the urban areas, uh, as you might expect. Um, about that townwide canopy, 38% is fairly high relative to the land base, land base uh, and it's actually comparable to canopy cover in uh, communities that have uh, mixed urban and rural land uses, such as maybe Langley Township uh, over in the Lower Mainland. Um, it's also higher than canopy cover in more urban cities, uh, such as the city of North Vancouver and the North Shore, or the city of New Westminster, also in the Lower Mainland, uh, where canopy cover is between 20 and 25 percent. So that uh, LIDAR method of mapping canopy, it, it also enables us to see the size of individual trees in Gibsons uh, and points towards some potential candidates for Gibsons' largest tree. Um, so the map on the slide here is showing the height of trees in Gibsons. Um, but similar mapping can also be prepared to show the breadth or spread of, of how wide a tree is uh, 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 throwing its branches uh, over the ground. And you can see on the map that uh, the tall trees uh, marked in yellow are mainly found around Gibson and Charmin Creek. Uh, so those natural areas where, uh, you know, um, trees have sufficient soil volume and water to grow uh, large and tall as our, as our native species often can. Although there are a few large uh, uh, trees scattered around the urban area as well. 
So what are some of those trees? Well, you, if you're coming to this event, I, I imagine you probably know some of them uh, well already. Um, but I, I just want to use this slide to talk about how the character of the urban forest uh, is a mix of natural places and urban ones, and its species mix reflects that. So in natural areas, uh, Gibson's, of course, has iconic trees like Arbutus in the picture at the left, uh, uh, as well as uh, other native trees like big leaf maple, tall conifers like uh, Sika spruce, Douglas fir, Grand fir, and Western red cedar. Um, all of them very familiar throughout the town. Well, in urban areas, uh, introduced species that don't grow here natively, uh, like linden, horse chestnut, honey locust, and red maple, um, are commonly seen and commonly planted because of their availability and their uh, ability to tolerate urban conditions. So another point that I want to make is that the urban forest differs by neighborhood. So this map is showing you canopy cover in each neighborhood uh, uh, used by the community uh, in its official community plan. And it's showing you effectively that there are differences between where trees are found in the city. So it makes it clear that some areas have less uh, canopy than average, i.e. less than 38%, and others uh, have much more and are contributing uh, more to the town's urban forest. So the historic urban core of Gibson's uptown areas and commercial areas in the Northwest, um, they have canopy cover that's significantly lower than the citywide average. Uh, with canopy cover between 21 and 24 um, percent. And another question that the UFP is going to ask, or the urban forest plan, excuse me, is going to ask, uh, is how each area's urban forest is likely to fare uh, given potential impacts uh, from challenges like uh, increasing development or climate change. So why does it matter um, that some neighborhoods and some areas have more trees and some have fewer? Well. Uh, to go back to the beginning of the presentation, proximity does matter for some of those uh, urban forest benefits or urban forest ecosystem services. And HEAT is just one example. Um, and we know that the urban forest is linked strongly uh, uh, to uh, uh, the urban heat island and can counteract the impacts of the urban heat island through shade uh, and evapor evaporative cooling. So in Gibson's, uh, the image at the left, the blue and yellow and red map, is showing you surface temperature um, measured during uh, uh, the June 2021 heat wave. Uh, and what you can see is that the red areas, which are the hottest, um, were over 12 degrees uh, warmer uh, uh, during the heat wave than, than areas that had uh, a high canopy cover of trees, um, which are those areas that are uh, in blue or, or for comparison in, in darker green on, on the map at the right. So um, land use and ownership are another important uh, facet uh, that are going to inform our work on the urban forest plan. Um, so the urban forest plan, of course, is going to work to recognize how policies and property ownership determine where the urban forest grows and how. Um, and of course, trees depend on us saving space in urban areas so that they can continue to thrive. And although not everywhere uh, in a city can be a natural forest, in the future, Gibsons could have greener streets or yards if the community desires it, um, as long as we have the right policies in place, that is. And uh, achieving higher canopy cover means that we will need to look uh, at some of those policies for land use and zoning to see uh, if they can better support trees, if, if that is what the community desires. Uh, ownership uh, does matter quite a bit uh, for urban forest management. Um, the town, of course, directly manages uh, uh, only those trees that are uh, located on its own property, um, which uh, add up to about one quarter of the whole urban forest. Um, well, in the middle of the, uh, the chart on this slide, you can see that almost three quarters uh, of citywide canopy is located on private property, um, so uh, properties that are just managed by their owners. And what this means is that everyone has a role to play in urban forest management. Um, because without trees on private property, Gibsons would be uh, quite an unfamiliar place. So um, those are some of the findings uh, that I wanted to share so far from our work. Um, the mapping work uh, and, and our review of the town's policies will continue as, as we hear from the community and, and uh, work forward uh, towards drafting the plan. Um, but now I want to I wanna address some of the challenges and opportunities that we're already aware uh, the plan is going to need to need to look at. So those include um, program capacity, uh, which relates to the town's uh, uh, actual ability and resources to conduct urban forest management, asset management, which is uh, sort of talking about how trees are managed by the town, issues related to urbanization, um, which can include redevelopment, the loss of trees to development, as well as the loss of soil volume, 
uh, and climate change, um, which of course we know is, is uh, uh, causing the loss of many, many trees in our community, um, including red cedar, grand fir, uh, and others. So a little bit more on um, what I mean by program capacity. So uh, these uh, slides are going to share uh, some of the findings uh, from our background review. Um, right now, the town's capacity to conduct urban forestry is uh, limited. Uh, there is no dedicated urban forestry team. So everybody uh, working on issues relating to trees and Gibsons currently works for one or another department. Um, um, and that means that there is limited capacity uh, for new tree planting uh, to grow the urban forest, as well as caring for trees uh, that uh, uh, exist in the town now. And there is lots of uh, local knowledge to draw on in terms of tree care, uh, planting, and protection. However, um, under current policies, credentials such as who's an ISA certified arborist uh, uh, can be an issue. Um, one bright spot that I want to highlight related to program capacity is that, uh, you know, this is a very passionate uh, community as well as uh, a town with passionate staff uh, who, are, who are invested in, in the future of the urban forest overall. So for asset management, as I mentioned before, trees aren't incorporated into the town's uh, asset management framework, which is uh, considered a leader for small communities in Canada. And what this means is that uh, right now we don't have a good plan for issues like pest diseases, uh, pests or disease outbreaks in the urban forest, um, how to care regularly for high value trees. And we also don't know much, uh, I'm sorry, how much an individual tree is worth uh, when we're trying to decide whether uh, it makes sense to remove it or, or retain it, uh, you know, if, if there is uh, a project uh, or development uh, with which it comes into conflict. Um, and uh, all that is to say, uh, you know, there is room for growth uh, in the way that the, the town sort of sets its priorities for caring for trees on, on public property. And a bright spot is that solid base in natural asset management, which is already being pioneered in Gibsons uh, with, relation, with relation to uh, stormwater areas, uh, uh, forested areas for managing stormwater. So the next challenge uh, is urbanization, uh, which I talked a little bit about already. Um, just to sort of put a Coles notes on it, urban environments often feature those restricted and compacted soil environments, which are hard for trees to grow in. Uh, as, as I discussed, urban environments can also um, be hotter, uh, as well as uh, potentially more polluted, um, challenging tree growth. Uh, and, and these are issues that compound uh, as, as uh, uh, impervious surface, uh, what, what we uh, uh, refer to uh, concrete, asphalt, and, and, and other hard surfaces as um, grow uh, in area, um, which tends to happen with redevelopment under, under uh, current policies. Uh, and these are some issues that um, cities around the country and the world are, are also facing. But uh, the bright spot is that um, development doesn't necessarily mean that the urban forest has to be uh, put to the side. It just means that we need the right policies in place uh, in order to ensure that space for trees is saved um, uh, where development does occur. And development itself can actually help create uh, uh, new planting spots in low canopy areas, as well as uh, help the town pay for urban forest enhancement. And uh, last but certainly not least, uh, we have climate change. Uh, and some of the impacts uh, on the urban forest associated with climate change include extreme weather, uh, which can be heat waves, drought, and wildfire, each of which can be destructive to trees of the wider forest. Um, climate change as it occurs, uh, warming does allow uh, new um, pests or diseases to uh, establish uh, in British Columbia, which can impact uh, Gibsons, of course. Um, and that is a highly uncertain uh, uh, um, outcome of climate change, which uh, we need to be aware of uh, and, ready, and ready to adapt our management towards. Um, uh, relatedly, that milder climate may enable uh, some species, some of which may already be here and not uh, causing many problems, to become what we call invasive, which means that they uh, are able to you know, more readily take over um, urban forest ecosystems or other natural areas. And overall, uh, in, in a warmer world, there's a greater need for healthy trees to, to help provide uh, benefits for community uh, climate adaptation, like shade and cooling. And there aren't a lot of bright spots to highlight here necessarily. Um, so I, I pulled out what is uh, uh, sort of a halfway bright spot, which is that uh, with climate change, 
um, there is potentially in the future uh, uh, the possibility that um, we can diversify uh, Gibson's urban forest to make it more resilient to shocks um, by increasing the number of trees that are planted here. However, I do also want to say that uh, increasing diversity in the urban forest can be contentious uh, because there are often uh, uh, competing interests in making sure that our natural environment and, and natural ecosystems are preserved. So with that said about some challenges and opportunities, uh, I just want to briefly touch on some next steps uh, to round out the presentation. Um, so as I've already shown this slide, I, I just want to go back here to, to remind you um, we're currently uh, uh, engaging with the public uh, as a prelude to beginning uh, the plan drafting in earnest. Uh, and once that plan is drafted towards the end of spring, um, there will be another opportunity for the public to review the, the, the draft before it becomes finalized and, and presented to town council. Um, so uh, you can uh, uh, stay tuned uh, to the Urban Forest Plan website uh, uh, for, for more information about uh, future opportunities. Um, the plan, of course, just to reiterate, uh, is going to help develop that vision, uh, 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 principles for management, um, targets and priorities, as well as recommendations to, to go out and, and implement uh, urban forest management in the community. And the immediate next steps, so I mentioned we're in phase one of our, our uh, public engagement for the urban forest plan, which is focused on understanding the community's vision, concerns, and aspirations for the urban forest uh, following plan drafting it's going to be a real opportunity to uh, receive that feedback on, on how we've done uh, uh, in terms of uh, capturing what we hear. And right now, um, you may uh, already know about this if you're at the event tonight, um, but we also do have a, a survey uh, that is asking uh, after some of your uh, uh, vision and, and uh, ideas for how the town can better manage the urban forest. Um, and if you go to the website shown on the screen, um, you will be able to uh, click through to that survey and, and share uh, with us there. And I strongly encourage you to do that if you have the interest. Um, and the survey will be available for uh, another two weeks after this open house. So if uh, someone uh, you know would be interested in, in the presentation that we've had tonight uh, is not here, um, please do uh, let them know um, that, they can, that they can participate in that way. So... With that, uh, that brings me to the end of uh, the presentation. So I just want to say thank you again very much for being here. Uh, and we're going to have uh, a transition to the question and ask, uh, answer period now. Um, so just uh, as a brief reminder before we get started here, um, I do have my uh, colleague Marco uh, working uh, sort of the chat box. So if you do have any questions that you would prefer to type rather than uh, uh, unmute to ask, uh, feel free to put them in uh, to the chat box and Marco will be keeping track of those and making sure that we uh, uh, do um, uh, 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 res respond to them in turn. Um, you're also welcome uh, to raise your hand uh, using the, the Zoom raise hand feature uh, to ask a question, and we will try to alternate questions from both sources so that, so that people in the chat and people raising their hand have equal opportunities to, to have a, qu a question answered. Um, with me uh, in the meeting tonight as well, uh, if there are questions uh, uh, of a highly specific nature, um, we do have uh, a representative of the town, Michelle Lewis, um, and uh, with that, um, I would say uh, I'll give it a little little minute, maybe a, a good a good time for people to uh, take a break, uh, uh, get a little drink of water, and uh, we will uh, start answering questions in just a minute. 